myself, I thought, man, that, that just kind of is funny. Not necessarily true, but funny. I mean, it is funny. It's not what represents us. But All right, back to the things that matter, all right? John chapter 1 and verse number 1, if you would follow with me, it says, and, and by the way, as we read through this, I want you to see if you can figure out what the theme, thought of this chapter is. You ready? Here we go. If you don't have your Bible with you, we have our Sky Bible, as I stated last week. Guess Sky Bible, you can follow it here. If you have your Bible, I would prefer you to pull it out and uh, physically feel it, touch it, whether it's electronic or paper, it doesn't matter. God's Word is powerful. And uh, have it in your hands. It says in verse number one and following, that which was from the beginning, which ye, uh, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we look upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with him, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our, that our joy may be complete. This is the message that we've heard from him and proclaim it to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Now, I want to ask you a question. Did you, did you figure out in that chapter kind of the running thought there? And it's mentioned actually four different times in that passage. Did anybody pick that up? What's the theme there? One word. Did you get it? All right. I, I don't mind to tell you, but I want you to go back and look at it. I want you to mark it in your Bible because I want you to see the theme of this chapter. The theme of this chapter is fellowship. It mentioned it four times in the passage, but the whole thought of the chapter is in, in reference to fellowship. If you notice... And of course we saw there in the first few verses that which was from the beginning which you heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which, you, which, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life that was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. What is that talking about? What was it that was with the Father and then became manifest to us. What was that? Come on, somebody speak up. Don't wait on somebody else, just say it. Jesus, okay? Jesus was with the Father and he was made manifest to us. John chapter one says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and did what? It dwelt among us. Jesus came from the presence of God to spend time with us so he came to have what with us fellowship all right let's stop there for just a moment and let's go back to the beginning of time in Genesis in chapter 1 and following the scripture talks about the creation of all things right what was the crowning jewel of all of God's creation what was it man you and me we were the crowning jewel of of God's creation. Isn't that amazing? How powerful is it that we can find that we can have a, that we can find that God finds a value in us that's so important that we were his crowning jewel to all of creation. 
That's amazing. Now, why did he create us? All right, I want you to think about that for a moment. God created us in order that we would have fellowship with him. Did you know that? All right, I think some of you missed it. Let me say it again. God created mankind in order that we would have fellowship with him. That's why God created us. Let's strip everything away. That's what it boils down to. And then Adam, he looked around, he saw that every animal in the garden had a, had a partner, and he noticed that he did not have a what? A partner. All right, I'm going to keep pushing on you until you start participating with me this morning because I, this, I don't want this to be one-sided this morning. As long as you're with me, I know you're with me, all right? I want to walk with you. I want to talk with you. I want to fellowship with you this morning, and we do that by that being a two-way street, all right? I don't want to lecture you this morning. I want to have a conversation with you. So we find that Adam realized that he didn't have a partner, and so God said it's not good for man to be alone, and so he put man into a deep sleep and he took a rib from man and he, he made woman and he made woman that she could be a help me for man. That's what it's all about. But let's boil it back down to why did God create man? In order that man could do what? Have fellowship with him. Period. Just because he threw another element in there didn't mean all of a sudden he changed his whole game plan. He didn't change his game plan. His game plan was in order that we would have fellowship with him. And to make that work better, he gave Adam a help meet to help him meet the daily needs of life in order that he could stay in consistent fellowship with God because now he's not having to carry this by himself. He's got somebody doing life with them and helping them, and that way he can have good attention to what was intended to be the centerpiece, fellowship with God. Then after all this happened, then something came into the world that messed up all the fellowship, right? And what was it? Sin, all right? It was actually the act of sin, but listen to me for just a moment. The purest definition of sin is simply this. True sin is breaking fellowship with God, period. That's what sin is. So whatever causes you and you and you and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, to break fellowship with God is sin for you. And our sin can all be different. My sin may be different for me than it is for you because there's some things that may draw me away from fellowship with God that may not be a problem for you at all. There may be things that draw you away from God that are absolutely no problem for me at all. But sin is when we break fellowship with God. So sin came into the world. And when sin came into the world, it came through mankind by mankind deciding to take of a fruit that God said, and ultimately it wasn't so much the taking of the fruit as the decision to ignore God and his fellowship to do our own thing and say, and by the way, I could never tell you how many times I've heard this said in counseling where I, I, I've said, you know, the word of God says this about this subject and I've had people go, yeah, I know that's what the Bible says, but really you're just gonna push the word of God off to the side and now you're gonna tell me what you really think as though what you really think is more important than what God really thinks? That's a problem. But we're all guilty of it. I'm not saying that as though somehow only some people say that. We all say that at times. I know God's word says that, but I really love them and I want to live with them. I, I know God's word says that, but I love to eat and food's just awesome and so I never know when to stop and so I eat until I feel like I'm about ready to explode and 
I know that God's word says this about this given subject, but... And when we butt God's word off to the side, we're butting our fellowship with God and now we're in sin before we ever commit the act of it. But then we complicate it by committing the act of it and it only makes that hole deeper because now we have to pay for the consequences of our actions. I want you to understand that God's most important thing that he's desired from us is fellowship. Can we be distracted from that fellowship? Anybody in here, can you get distracted from that fellowship? All right, about three or four of you, five, six of you are gonna be honest with me. The rest of you are gonna chew on that, all right? That's, I understand we can all chew on those moments. We can all try to figure that out. But at the end of the day, I wanna tell you something. Listen to me, I can drive down the road and go, oh, yard sale. Oh, yard sale. Is there anything wrong with yard sales? there's nothing wrong with yard sales but distractions are in front of us all day long aren't they and the only reason I bring it up is because on Friday I was going over to my mom's house to visit with her for a little bit and I'm like bebopping along thinking I'm going to go in fellowship with my mom and, and just minister to her and next thing you know I'm seeing yard sale signs I'm thinking boy that'd be fun stop at a yard sale all of a sudden I get lose fellowship with my mom because I got distracted you see how that works? Nothing wrong with yard sales, but anything that breaks our fellowship with God is sin. And we have to watch out for that. Now, can I fellowship with God? As I, can your job, by the way, can your job become the thing that breaks your fellowship with God? Yes or no? Yes, so you better quit that job, right? No, <laughs> no. Not unless you work somewhere that you know that is just not pleasing to God and you're living an immoral life and whatever it is that you're having to do or you're having to make uh, or you're having to make corrupted decisions to be deceptive in your job I worked at, a, at a car lot years ago back when I was in my early 20s and I thought I could make that work I really did but the things that I was pressed on from my management the things I had to say went against everything that was about me and it, I had to compromise my integrity and I said, no, this job's not gonna work for me and I had to quit. So there are some jobs, yeah, you do have to get away from if they do those kind of things to you. But at the end of the day, it's not if your job distracts you from fellowship with God, you gotta quit your job. It's just a matter of you need to have fellowship with God in your job and do a good job while you're at your job. Does that make sense? Hey, the yard sale, nothing wrong with that. How about go pick up mom and go take her and have some fellowship at the yard sale? I haven't broke fellowship. We can just do something together, right? You see how that works? I can let something break my fellowship or I can have fellowship and do the right things. Now, if you find yourself in a place that the things that are trying to distract you from your fellowship with God is something you couldn't invite God to come do with you, then what you're doing is wrong anyway. You need to get away from it, whatever that might be. If you couldn't invite God to show up with you to it, then maybe there's an issue there, right? If you can't invite God into a relationship you're in because you know God wouldn't be pleased with it, you know he'd be unhappy with the situation, then maybe your relationship is a relationship you shouldn't be in. Now, by the way, if you're married, don't get out of it. That's not what I'm saying. Don't, oh, Pastor John said, I go get a divorce now. No, I'm not saying that. Hey, you know, you made your bed or you messed up your bed. You need to lie in it now. You, you picked your sticks, all right? Now you gotta build your house of sticks you got. God can do that. He can take a broken marriage and he can make something beautiful out of it, but you need to put it in the hands of God. You need to watch what he can do with it. Now hear me out this morning. Our, our walk with God was the reason why God created us in order that we could have fellowship with him. Now tell me, what is fellowship? What is fellowship? It's relationship. What does that look like? I, let's look at it. I know you're here and you're in a God mindset, but let's take it and boil it down to just earthly relationships. What is a 
what does fellowship with someone else look like? What does that look like? Spending time with them, and what do you do when you spend time with somebody? Sharing information, so you talk with them. What else you do? Most of the time. You eat with them, what else? Praise Jesus, you are Baptist for real. All right, what else? We walk with them, don't we? We walk with them, we talk with them, we have fellowship with them. That's what happens. Now, when sin came into the world, when the attitude of Adam and Eve took that mindset, I know God said that, but sin came into the world, then they took of the fruit, and that solidified the decision of their sin. Guess what God did with man every day in the garden after God created man? What did he do every day? He fellowshiped with them. He walked with them in the cool of the day. The scripture says he came down and he'd walk with them every day. But right after they sinned, God refused to come. Did you know that? Good, I'm glad you're looking at me like that because that's not true. God didn't refuse to come when man sinned. The day that man sinned, God came to fellowship with them even though they had sinned. Do you think he knew they sinned? Yes, but he came to have fellowship with them anyway. But guess what their act of sin caused them to do? What was that? They hid. They ran from God, right? Rather than now walking with God and talking with God, they ran from God and they hid themselves because of their sin. God wants us to have fellowship with him. That is so paramount to God. Not to let anything become a distraction to us from having fellowship with him. That's really, really, really important. I don't know what that looks like for you individually in your life, but that's crucial that you get that right. If God had one thing in mind when he created man was for us to have fellowship with him, then that ought to become paramount to every individual that's a believer in Christ to have fellowship with God and that will become the driving force of who we are now let's go on and look at these verses and it says that Jesus came and it says in verse 3 that which we have seen and heard and proclaim also to you so that you too may have what fellowship with us he's saying look as disciples we want you to understand we proclaim to you what has been proclaimed to us that we need to have fellowship and I'm saying to you that we all need to have fellowship one with another that's important now there's some people who say oh you know pastor I, I love God and I read God's word I just don't have anything to do with the church and I don't spend much time with anybody else but I have a strong relationship with God hear me out that is not an uncommon thing for me to hear from people and can I give you a little hint and I'm going to say it really blunt <laughs> they're liars all right let me just help you understand I'm not the one that said they were liars, okay? I'm just being a messenger because now you're gonna listen to it because here's what God says. Listen to what he says in his word. It says, the re and the reason for this fellowship that God wants us to have, it's to fe have fellowship with one another and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ, and we are writing these things that our joy may be complete. Now, let me just say this, and I'm gonna get to who called them a liar in just a moment, but here's what I want you to understand. I want something for you. I want your joy to max out. I want it to peak out on the, on the meter. That's what I want. I want that for you. 
And there's no way your joy will be complete if you are the person who says, I have fellowship with God, I spend time with God, I have a relationship with God, but I don't want nobody getting too close to me and we get arm's distance from one another because you are not going to be a person who has a completed joy. You will not because God created you for community. Matter of fact, God is community within himself. Did you know that? God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They're a community within themselves. And we are made in the likeness of God. We are made for community. That's how God made us. He made us for fellowship. He made us to walk life together, to talk to one another, to walk with each other. Praise God, to eat with one another. All those things are part of that fellowship God wants us to have with one another. So he goes on to say that your joy will be complete if you get these things in order. But there is a way to get them in order, but we're going to get there. This is the message which we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is what? That was good. Let's try that one more time. All right. It says, but um, was I in verse 7? Verse 5, thank you. This is a message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is what? Light. He's light. And where lightness, where light, where light is present, guess what is not present? Darkness. Did you know light drives out darkness? Did you know that? If you walk in a dark room with light, all right, it's kind of like the old thing. You remember as a kid, you'd take a bowl of water and put pepper in it and then take detergent, like I think it's Dawn detergent, and go boop and drop one little drop in the middle of the, of the pepper in the water. All the pepper goes boop to the sides of the bowl. All right, you got to try it. It's really cool. Saw that in one of these magic books. I was like, that's magic, but it's not magic. But I used to love to read magic books, and that was a little thing. It's like, I'm going to try that. That's cool. There's something about that Dawn detergent or whatever detergent you put in there that causes then the pepper to run. And that's the way light is. When light walks into the room, the darkness scatters to the furthest corners of the room because it doesn't like light. Light and darkness doesn't mix. They don't go together. Where there's light, there is no darkness. And where darkness abides, the light is absent. Now hear me out for a minute. I don't know if you're going through a dark time in your life, but what you need to do is invite the light. Because the light of God will drive out those dark things in your life. They will. I'm not saying that all of a sudden everything's going to be hunky-dory and, and there's going to be sunshine and roses and never going to have any problems or any troubles. No, but as long as you abide in the light, you'll find yourself walking in the light and not in hopelessness. You'll not find yourself in the darkness. And it goes on to say here in verse number 6, or the end of verse number five says, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in the dark, while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If I'm living in darkness and yet I brag all day long about how much I love my flashlight and how great my flashlight is and that my flashlight works better than anybody else's flashlight and, and I can out flashlight your flashlight and, and, and boy, my flashlight's awesome but I sit in the darkness and I say, man, I love my flashlight. I abide in the light of my flashlight and I never turn it on. I am a liar and a truth's not in me. 
Just because you take the word of God and you make it something important in your home and you're always dusting it off, making sure it's always clean and it sets on the coffee table or whatever and you make out about how important it is to you and how important God is and yet you are not fellowshipping with God every day. You're not in his word. You're not coming to church and being around God's people. You can say that you love God and yet you're walking in darkness because walking in darkness is when you're not walking in the light. When you walk in the light, you're walking with God. True? All right, my, my cousin and I used to love to go, um, we, we used to love to go exploring. And so we lived on Washington Street in Henderson, Kentucky uh, with my, I, I did with my grandma for a short time while we were building our house out in Basket. So while we lived there, she had this, she didn't, but there at the road, there was this culvert that started from the creek underground and it went all the way out to OUS 41 and right under OUS 41. The opening was on the other side. And my cousin and I, we used to take our flashlights and we had walked through there and we had walked all the way down there and, and like, you know, you'd see the light behind you but you could not see light in front of you because the culvert went like this and then it curved and it kept curving and then it'd be another straight line at a given point. So you'd walk and the light would begin to disappear behind you. Next thing you know, it was dark in front of you and dark behind you, but we had flashlights. And then we decided a couple times we were gonna be really brave and we were gonna do it without flashlights. And so we did. We started along down through there and it get darker and darker. And of course, the tendency is when you can't see nothing in front of you to wanna to turn and look at the light every once in a while just so you could feel a sense of, 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 um, of, um, Point of reference is what I'm trying to say, but I can't think of the word. You want to have a point of reference because you can't see anything. So you have to turn to look at the light so you got a point of reference to know, okay, that's where we came from. We got to keep going. And you're walking through there and you can't see where you're going. You happen to feel your way through. And then when you get about midway of that bend, now it's dark behind you and it's dark in front of you and you can see nothing. Now, we were young and we didn't really think about the fact that there could be snakes, there could be raccoons, there could be possums down in there because that's where those kind of things hang out and spiders that love to make webs and no telling how big they are. I hate spiders, right? Now, that's the good thing about cats. Cats will like, they, I think, right? I've seen cats like go after spiders. That's a good thing about a cat. All right, say, hey, I said something good about a cat, all right? Now, Here's the thing, is that when you're walking through there, it's dark. And it's not until we kept walking around that bend, all of a sudden we could vaguely see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And so we would keep walking towards the light. And the more we walked towards the light, the more in the light we were walking. And the less in darkness we walked. And do you realize that's the way it is with God? When we walk towards God, he is the light, and the more we walk towards him, the less we're walking in the darkness. That's what God wants for us, for us to walk in the light. And it goes on to say here in this passage, in verse number seven, but if we walk in the light, or, or verse number six, if we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. In other words, practicing the truth means we're not just a hearer of the word, but we're a doer of the word. There's a lot of people who think because they hear the word of God, oh, preacher, I read my Bible every day. And yet nothing in their life changes whatsoever. They're not putting to practice what they read. They're walking in darkness. It's like the person that holds a flashlight and never turns it on. Application, bing, makes all the difference. You don't turn on the flashlight, what good does it do to have the flashlight? What good does it do to be a hearer of the word and not to be a doer of the word? What good is it? Are you practicing the word in your life? Or you continue to 
muddle around in the darkness of your own decisions, kind of just your fellowship with God's going to have to wait a little bit because, look, I got a career to build. I got a boyfriend to have. I got to have a girlfriend. I got to have this relationship. I got to have uh, these particular possessions. I got to, you know, and we could think of all the things in the world we want to put in place first and then, then we'll have fellowship with God. But God says he wants us to have fellowship with him right now no matter what that is, no matter what that looks like in our life. He wants to be the light of our life. And he wants us to put to practice the truth of his word. Verse 7 says, And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, now please don't miss that part, but if we walk in the light as we choose to walk in the light, is that what it says? If we walk in the light as we choose to walk in the light, is that what it says? Doesn't, does it? It says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with what? One another. All right, let's go back to what I was telling you earlier. If you're the person who says, oh, I have fellowship with God, I love God, I read my Bible, I spend time with God every day, but I really am staying arm lengths away from other people, other Christians and all that, then you're walking in the darkness because the Bible says if you have fellowship and you walk in the light as, as Christ is in the light, you will have fellowship one with another. We will. You're driving a car. and something goes bad under the, in, under the hood of your car, what typically shows up first on your dash? What's that? Yes, the idiot light. <laughs> the engine light, right? My dad always called it the idiot light because it really doesn't tell you anything, but there could be one of 100 things wrong with your car, all right? By the way, I say that for entertainment purposes. I'm not a mechanic. I don't want you to take, go home and go, I got 100 things wrong with my car. All right, I don't know how many things that light represents, but it represents a lot of different problems. I've even found out that engine light also represents when your brakes and your ABS is going out too. So your ABS light comes on. When it comes on, your engine light typically comes on at the same time. I'm like, oh, great, I got two problems. Only to find out later, no, that typically is one problem. It just is letting you know. And I'm like, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> All right? But the light comes on. In the good old days, for those of us that are just a fraction older than a few of the rest of you, we had gauges on our car. And those gauges showed you it was a hot needle. And it showed you things. And, and you had the oil pressure. And it showed you what your oil pressure looked like in your car. There's a lot of different, there's the battery uh, gauge that was on your car that let you know if your battery was charging right and all those kind of things. Now they still make vehicles with that, trucks and buses and stuff, but cars, you don't typically see those gauges on vehicles anymore. But how do you know something's wrong under the hood is by looking at the gauges. Would you agree with me? All right, let me show you a gauge God gives you. Hear me for just a minute, and I'm going to set it up by saying this first. This is going to sound really disjointed, but you'll understand hopefully in a minute. Not everybody who comes to church is a Christian. Just like, just because you go to McDonald's doesn't make you a hamburger, right? But what do you find at McDonald's? Hamburgers. What do you find at church? Christians. But not everybody who comes is a Christian. Not everything that shows up in McDonald's is a hamburger. Does that make sense? Now, having said that, applying that same thought here, looking at the gauge on my dash, when I am failing to have fellowship with my brothers and sisters in Christ, it is a problem. It's showing me it's going on under the hood of my car. My fellowship with God is suffering when my gauges are showing my, my fellowship with one another is suffering. Does that make sense? Now, please, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. There are some people who have great fellowship with other people, but their fellowship with God still stinks out loud. In other words, they spend, they're distracted by nothing but 
being with other people all the time. They have no fellowship with God because they don't have time to have fellowship with God because they're too busy having fellowship with other people. Now, again, that fellowship is like a yard sale. Anything wrong with a yard sale? No. Anything wrong with fellowship with one another? No. Invite my mom to go to the yard sale. Invite God to be in my fellowship with one another. You see how that works? But it's when those things become our distraction, they become our sin. God wants us to have fellowship with him. And when I am walking in the light as he is in the light, I will have fellowship one with another. We'll spend time together. We'll do life together. Because that's what happens when we're walking in the light. And he goes on to say there, In verse number seven, but if we walk in the light, he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There's a lady out in California, my dad preached a message, boy, he's talking about for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, that we're all sinners and that uh, we all make bad choices and we all do people wrong and blah, 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 and he is going on with this and stuff and uh, gave a great invitation, all that, but man, at the end of the service, he was at the back door shaking hands. This one lady came out and she looked at him eyeball to eyeball and she said, preacher, you were wrong today. I'm not a sinner. I'm a good person. I've lived a good life. I've never treated anybody wrong. How dare you call me a sinner? Listen, just because we don't think that we're sinners doesn't mean we're not. The scripture says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, if we confess our sins, then what? He is what? Praise God. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from what? All unrighteousness. What is the pivotal part of that verse? Can you tell me? What word? One word, if. If you don't, it won't happen. If you do, it will happen. It's conditional. If we confess our sins, he then takes over. I love that. It's just like a parent, all right? I've done this with my kids before where there's things that they're having a hard time with and I sit back and I let them keep having a hard time with it and I just let them struggle with it. You say, well, that's terrible parenting. No, it's not terrible parenting. I'm waiting for them to look and go, Dad, is there any way that you can help me with this? Absolutely. And I want to jump in. I want to help them. But if they don't ask, I let them be. I let them learn for themselves. It's hard. It's difficult. It doesn't have to be that hard if you just ask for some help. Right? Great lesson to learn. If we confess our sin, he is faithful. He takes over. He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to wash us clean, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it goes on to say, if we say we have not sinned, we make him what? Now listen, I don't know if anybody in here would have the ability to look up into heaven. I know I couldn't look up at God and say, God, you're a liar. Oh, maybe we've thought it before because we didn't understand something. But to straight out come out and call God a liar, I think, man, that'd be like, whoo. But do you realize the scripture's telling us here that if we position ourselves in a place where we go, hey, you know what? That preacher's talking about sin. He ain't talking about me. I don't have any sin. I got it all stride and right. You know what? Even when we got it stride and right, we still got darkness nipping our heels because just because you're walking in light don't mean you don't have darkness nipping your heels. We're all having to deal with sin every day. Let me put it in practical terms. We're all having to deal with distractions from fellowship with God every day, every one of us. And if you don't, I'd like to know what bubble you're living in. And I'd like for you to invite me to it, okay? It don't exist. 
is something we have to understand every day. Sin nips at our heels, and if we say we have no sin, we make God a liar, and his word is not in us. Can I help you understand this? If you say that you are not dealing with sin in your life and the struggle of sin in your life, then God's word does not abide in your life. It is not residing and dwelling inside of you. And you can take it up with God if you feel differently. That's what God said. Sin comes in a lot of shapes and forms and looks different for all of us and, and those distractions can be different and every single one of us in this auditorium have different things that try to distract us from fellowship with God. Every one of us. The scripture says, he that knoweth to do good and doesn't do it to him, it is what? Sin. Sin. If there's things that you know you ought to be doing and you're not doing it, you're sinning, the scripture says. That's huge. So we have to do a hard examination. And all God wants for us to do to get our fellowship with one another right is get your fellowship with him right. When your fellowship with him's right, then you have the foundation of good relationships with other people. And then your center core peace becomes... Christ Jesus.